gonna, I think they're going to take him to the playground at some point. But I don't know anything. So follow their lead. How is everyone? Good? Romans chapter 2, verse 25 through 29 is what we're going to be reading. That's where we're going to be spending most of our time. We'll jump around. You guys there? All right. Here we go. The Jewish ceremony of circumcision has value only if you obey God's law. But if you don't obey God's law, you're no better off than an uncircumcised Gentile. And if the Gentiles obey God's law, won't God declare them to be his own people? In fact, uncircumcised Gentiles who keep God's law will condemn you Jews who are circumcised and possess God's law, but don't obey it. For you are not a true Jew just because you were born of Jewish parents or because you have gone through the ceremony of circumcision. No, a true Jew is one whose heart is right with God. The true circumcision is not merely obeying the letter of the law, rather it is a change of heart produced by God's Spirit, and a, and a person with a changed heart seeks praise from God, and some translations will say seek praise from God, but will receive praise from God. So either way, you're either looking for it from Him, and hopefully you're getting it from Him, okay? That's what we're looking for. But they're definitely not from people. You're not seeking praise from people. As I was studying this week, Part of my study is not just in the Bible. I, I, I try to read some good books. And um, I'm reading a book right now, and it's just simply called Gospel. It's a great book by J.D. Greer, and I would recommend anybody read it. But as I was reading it, and it wasn't something that he necessarily said out of his book, but as I was reading it, I had this thought. And I, I just want that to happen for you. Like, when you're reading something, it should stimulate your brain to think. Don't just sit there, uh, reading my Bible, out of obligation. Like, let it stimulate you to think. Think about what you're reading. So I'm reading this book, too, and it's taught to me that every single thing that we do in our life, every single thing cries there's something wrong. Just think about it for a second. Degenerative vertebrae, they're just falling apart. 
We go get a new car because our car is not right. We want to be happy, so we get a new shirt, we get new pants, we get a new house, we go get a new job, we want to make a new friend. Why is it that we're always trying to do something? Could it be that because right as it is, it's just not good? I mean, we're always trying to do something. Even if you're not doing anything, you just sit at home resting. It's because you're not at rest. You're just not happy. Something's not right. You just everything we do, we're trying to gather more money, gather another job, gather another hobby, gather another friend, gather another house, get a new degree, find a new hobby, fix my hair, get a new hairdo. Get new hair. They still have that spray on. Do they still have that? Someone sprayed it on me while I was sleeping. But we do stuff. Like, you just think about it for a second. Everything you do from the time you wake up. Well, I shouldn't even say that. I was going to say to the time you go to sleep. But you're sleeping because you're resting, because you're not at rest, because you're tired. Nothing's working. We're always trying to fix this. Something's jacked up, man. And, and, and this text here, pardon, my, pardon the wind, I lost a little phone today, but part of this text it tells us that people are trying to fix this problem that we have. This void, this vacancy, this something busted. And we're trying to fix it. And our nature is to fix it externally. To put on a show. And everything that I just listed is an attempt to try to make your life better because it just doesn't seem to be working right. You always are looking to do something. Like even getting up and going to work is because you need to make more money to fix this, to make more money to, to get that because you're just not satisfied. This is a great problem in a human soul. And our text tells us that and uses this issue of circumcision as this outward mark, this outward thing that you could see that would kind of help things, maybe. I, don't, I disagree. I want to date some of you. Back in, i got to carry my notes with me because it's windy. Back in 56 to 2001, there was a game show. It was long running. It first started at CBS, and then it went to NBC, and then it went to syndication for years. Alex Trebek was actually the host of it for a while. And it was called To Tell the Truth. Anyone remember? couple people, not many. You'll put your hand out quick, right? Yeah. Um, here's the story. This is what happens. If three people, right? So here's the three people. This won't work because there's two girls and one boy. So, but let's just say there's three girls and three boys. And they hit behind the wall. And the celebrities would be over here on this side of the wall. One person honestly was Jared. The other two were liars. And they tried to fake them out. And these celebrities had to try to figure out who the real one was. Remember with the real Slim Shady, please stand up? That's where it came from. Michael, that was for you. Okay? That's where it came from. So they would, they would try to figure it out. And at the end of the show, they'd say, with the real Jared Scanlon, please stand up. And they would all go. And then they'd get up, and that's who it was. So you're trying to figure out who this authentic Jared Scanlon was. And so if you call yourself a Christian, let's say that's your name. If you're a Christian, a follower of Christ, a disciple of Christ, a follower of the way, you're the chosen, if you're really, really high and holy, you're the cho chosen nation of priests. I like to use that one. But whatever you call yourself, this should be an outside and an inside change. It should be something visible and invisible that's going on inside of you that would mark who you really are. Now the invisible will make itself visible. We studied that a couple of weeks ago, remember? That when you really get saved, it will manifest itself in your actions. You all remember that, and it's very, very true. Now in this text here, he's talking about the ancient uh, circumcision, the Jewish circumcision that was to identify who they were. And you can talk about any religious ceremony or tradition that we go through, but in this case it was circumcision. This is the deal with the circumcision. 
On the eighth day, mom and dad would bring the child to the temple, to the rabbi, and they would cut off the child's foreskin. Now, it was just for the males, not for the females, which already poses a problem just for me. I don't know if that poses a problem for you, but it poses a problem for me, that only the males got done. It was an act of obedience on the behalf of the parents, not the child. It was an act that showed identification of who this child was, for sure. But let me just ask you, did this child have anything to do with it? Very passive role here. It's eight years old. The kid's eyes are probably not even eight. I'm sorry, did I say eight years? Eight days old. The child's eyes are probably not even open yet. And if they were, it just happened. They have no idea what's going on, do they? No idea what's going on. So, can this act of obedience on behalf of the parents have any impact on the child? Could it turn the child's heart? Could it turn the child's heart's affections towards God by snipping off its foreskin? This is what was going on. And I say it wouldn't. A loss of foreskin will not create love will not create compassion, generosity, forgiveness, or radical hospitality in anybody. As a matter of fact, just taking off a piece of skin from someone's body is not going to cut out their greed or their selfishness or their lust or any other wickedness. It's not going to work, is it? It has no way of affecting the person. In today's context, a little bit different. We get a lot of people with tattoos now. I have one. My wife has many. There's others that have many. I've seen many people put crosses over their heart. They mean well. Let me tell you something. It's just like the ancient circumcision. No matter how deep the needle goes in, no matter how much ink is used, it's not going to clean a despicable, dirty heart. It's not going to matter. I see people with it all the time. My brother Eric here, he just got a tattoo with a verse, right? I'm not ripping Eric, I'm just saying that's a common thing now. Y'all seen it, right? People get verses on their body, they get crosses on their heart, they get Jesus all over their back, and it doesn't affect them in any way. They still act the same as before they got it. And it's the same thing with a circumcision. I can tell you from a voice of experience, I'm Jewish, so I got that done, and I didn't act very godly for a long, long time. It really makes no difference. So my point is this. Just because someone, quote unquote, looks Christian, they have the mark of the cross over their heart, they've been circumcised, whatever it is, just because they look Christian, that doesn't mean that they necessarily are. What the gospel does is it really tells us who we are in Christ. It formulates a relationship with God that, that exceeds the externals. The world sees externals, but they don't see genuine Christ-like character in those that have the externals on them. And the world is starving to see an authentic expression of the character of Christ. And that's what they will come to. Just, I would offer you this. Just because someone is praying, that doesn't mean that they're Christ-like. Just because someone is giving generously, it doesn't mean that they're Christ-like. Just because they're helping people, that doesn't mean they're a Christian. Just because they clean up their act, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're a Christian. Do me a favor, if you will, and turn to Colossians chapter 2. I always like for you to reference the Bible. I tell you this all the time, but I don't want you to just stand here, sit here and listen to some raving loon yell at you. I want you to see that the, the truth of God's Word. I want you to read it. Let it sink down deep into your heart and change you. This, this Word has power. And it, it's weird how, like, if you just read it, it changes who you are. I can't explain that. Don't ask me to. In Colossians 2.23, it says this about these religious actions. that These rules may seem wise because they require strong devotion Prayer, helping people, giving, pious self-denial, maybe fasting, severe bodily discipline, again, fasting, helping people out. These 
rules may seem wise, but they require, because they, str they require strong devotion, highest self-denial, and severe bodily discipline, but they provide no help in conquering a person's desires. You see, that's what God wants to do. He doesn't want you to just go to church. He doesn't just want you to pray. He doesn't want you to just give. There's lots of people worldwide that give millions of dollars. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're Christian. Because sometimes they do it not for His glory, but for their own. That's the problem. They do it for their own glory, not for the one who deserves it. I would venture to say that there's a poser problem in the church. See, there's a poser problem in the church. You know how I know that there's a poser problem in the church? When the divorce rate in the church is the same as the divorce rate out of the church, there's a poser problem. See, when you stand up before men and women and you take a vow to follow Christ and you talk about how powerful Jesus is and he's well able to do this and to do that and he, he's the creator and the sustainer of all things and we're going to keep our eyes on Jesus and he can make all things work out and seek first his kingdom and all these things shall be added to you and all that good stuff, right? You do this, right? And then you get divorced, 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 divorced. What's that say about Jesus? He's weak. He can't do nothing. Because I don't think the people that stand up for us, my, you know, all of us, I'm not ripping on anyone in particular. Do we really follow Christ? And that's what God wants. He wants you to truly follow Him. Just not go through the motions of religious activities. Like, this isn't even a religious activity right here. Let's call it what it is. We're gathering out here, out in the park. It's a religious activity. It's not, it's not a sporting event, is it? It's a religious activity. What's our motive here? See, that's what we need to be thinking about. What's our motive here? We should all be thinking about it. Why did we come here today? Is it so that people will go, hey man, you guys got a cool church? They say we have a cool church? That's great. Super, great, awesome. But that's not what it's about. Every single thing that we do should point people to God. Not to ourselves, not to me, not to them singing, not to anybody, except Jesus. That's what he wants from us. The world is starving for authentic Christianity, and it doesn't see it too often. I share a story with you about a pastor of a church in Ocala. It's well known, it's no secret. This was years and years ago. They planted a church. It's called, it was called the Ocala Word of Faith Church. It was pretty big, but they started in the Ocala Hilton in a little conference room. They would have dreamed of having this many people. 14, 15 people in a little room. His name is Tim Gilligan. And I don't know what his wife's name is. We're talking about authentic Christianity. Let me tell you about what authentic Christianity is and why I mentioned marriage. Years and years ago, they started this church. They added up to about 1,500 people. That's pretty big, isn't it? Rocking and rolling. Sending missionaries. It was awesome. People get saved. People get baptized. Groups are growing. Launching small groups in homes. Youth group is rocking. And their wife has an affair with the choir director. And gets pregnant. Awful, right? So the elders of the church called Pastor Gilligan in. And they said, listen, we, we can't have that leading our church. Your house is a wreck. And we don't want you to make our house a wreck. So we need you to step down. He says, no. I'm not going to step down. So this is what he does. And a lot of you are going to go, oh, I wouldn't do that. Gave his wife. She severed the relationship with the choir director, repented, he forgave her, and now he's raising that child like it's his own. And now the church is 5,000 people. See, what the 
world really wants is authentic Christianity. They don't want lip service. They don't want to, you to have a cross on your heart. They don't want you to, well, don't show them that you're circumcised, but you know what I'm saying, right? You know what I mean? Like, they don't want to see that you have a cross. They don't want to see your tattoos necessarily. They want to see that you'll live by what it says. And that, that pastor, man, I admire that man. He did what many of us would not do, would you? You don't have to say yes or no, but that's a tough call. But you know what? At the heart of the gospel is reconciliation. Think for a moment how rotten you are. And yet God, while you're a sinner, is willing to lay his life down for you, that you might have life. Imagine that. What is it that someone could do to you that you could turn from them? Based on that, think of that for a moment. Who here deserves heaven? Who deserves this breeze? Who deserves a breath? Who deserves to be loved? I was thinking about that today because I'm thinking about this gospel thing, right? That I don't deserve anything, and yet this beautiful woman, she could, I mean, she's pretty, like, Pretty girls don't last out there, do they? Why would she choose me? That's crazy, right? I mean, why Why would she? I don't deserve that. So what is it that she could do that would make me turn my affections from her? Based on the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what we need to be thinking. We don't need to be thinking about fixing our behavior anymore. About, hey, you shouldn't drink and smoke and this and that. No, you know what we need to do? We need to ponder the gospel. We need to spend time, not in more Bible studies, not going on more mission trips. We need to spend more time meditating on the fact that I am a horrible, horrible, rebellious kid. And my daddy still loves me. See, when you let that sink down deep into your heart, religious activity doesn't mean a whole lot. When you let the fact that you are, you are unworthy of love, you are unworthy of being able to see this, to enjoy this, to have friends that love you, like you're unworthy of that, but you get it anyway, if that's the way God is with you, isn't it so much easier to do that with other people? Just not hate each other. Everyone in this church is a misbehavior, myself included. We rip each other down all the time. It's time to stop that. What we need to be doing around here is encouraging each other and helping people to fall in love with Jesus more. See, out of that, everything else takes care of itself. Everything else takes care of itself. Jesus talked about normal people that are, you know, these religious guys, mask-wearing, empty cistern, whitewashed tombs, the ones who look religious on the outside, fancy prayer people. I can't pray like him. He uses King James. And I'll tell you what, those, those Pentecostal people, they know how to pray. Anybody knows how to pray. Can you talk? I know you can all talk. And you can pray beautifully. You can pray beautifully. We were, I'm going to rip on the king of the coals back there. We were at dinner a couple weeks ago, right? Man, he botched that prayer big time. <laughs> Y'all remember that one? He couldn't, he, he messed up so bad, he's like, in his prayer, he's like, man, I don't even know what to say. It was awesome. It was perfect. He was just talking to God, right? Does it have to be so fancy? Oh, reverent, awesometh, mightieth, fathereth, and heaveneth. I mean, really? That would make me lose my dinner. I'm good, I'm happy we pray beforehand. Whitewashed tombs, Jesus said, to those people that were religious. 
you know, whitewash used to do that to the fence. You know, it wasn't really a good paint job. It was a very temporary thing. It made it kind of look good, but it really wasn't. And that's what Jesus says about people that just base their relationship on God on, on their duty, their performance before men and women in their religious duties. And that's not the way we're supposed to be. He said it was whitewashed tombs. In other words, it looked good on the outside, right? But on the inside, it was a stench of death and disease. There was emptiness there. There was nothing there. It's almost like, like if you went to King Tut's tomb, you know? All glamorous. I'm sure there's treasures in there, but there's nothing really there anymore on the inside. Ugly, dead, empty. And that's what religious folks are. And here's the thing with religious folks. If, if, I don't know. If, I guess Granny's not here, is she? Granny's not here. I wanted Granny to see. You all know Granny, right? Little old lady. Come on, man. Meredith's grandmother. Yes, 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 yes. She's about this tall? Yeah. Right? You remember her? Right? So, so if I had, if, listen, if I had Granny stand up right here, Jared, you know Jared, right? Everybody knows Jared? Yeah? Now, we're talking about American culture here. This man stands up with his gold teeth and tattoos all over him. Now, you have, now, honestly, honestly, in America, how many people are going to say, which one's the Christian? Little Granny, right? Little Granny's the Christian, right? Well dressed, well behaved, she looks the part, right? But here's the answer. This is what the answer should be. I don't know. I don't know. That should be our answer to everyone. I, I don't know. I really don't know who the Christian is. See, God looks inside to the cause and the motivation for choices and words and actions. You know what we do? We look at their shirt. We look at the kind of music they listen to. We, li we look at what neighborhood they live in. We listen to their vocabulary. We check out their hairdo. Do they raise their hands in church? Because if they do, man, they are super Christians. Do they go every week? Do they go on mission trips? Do they give lots of money to the church? Are they fancy prayer people? Who cares? Who cares if they are? So you might fool someone here with all that stuff, right? But you ain't fooling God. You ain't fooling God. But I don't want to rip down like religious activity. The Bible here in Romans, it says that it actually has value. So here I am saying that, that religious activity has no value. It's kind of bad. It's bad at that. But you know what? The Bible does say that it has value. If you look back in Romans, in the text, it says it. In verse 25, the Jewish ceremony of circumcision. So just any religious activity, any function, it has value. But there's, a, there, there's an asterisk, if you will. It says, only if you obey God's law. So how can, how can religious activity actually have value? What is that? When? How? Sorry for the wind. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says that we are Christ's ambassadors. That Christ, God, is making his appeal through us. Now based on that fact, Religious activity can have value. It can have value. See, if, if the face that is being displayed before everybody is the face of a person that truly loves and follows God, then it can draw people to Him. Then it's of value. Do you understand? If we do religious activities, but it's, it's the face of a man or a woman who honestly follows Jesus Christ, and when he does it, it's to draw people to him, then it has value. You get me? But, if it's a facade, then the easily found hypocrisy and greed and self-centeredness and praise of self will push people away from God. So it all depends on your motive, why you're doing these things. Do you understand? See, Jesus addresses this specifically. In Matthew chapter 6, 
It's in red. In Matthew chapter 6, he talks about doing your good deeds before men. And he says, if we're doing it to be admired, or if we're doing it to call attention to ourselves, then it's bad. See, that has no value. Why? Because it's drawing attention to the person who's performing it, not to the one who sits on the throne in heaven. He talks about prayer, too. He says, and this is just kind of a, a paraphrase, Well, you can read the whole section. He says, don't put on a show. Don't repeat, 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 stand up in fancy garb with the chef hat on and do fancy prayers over and over and over again. Don't put on a show. He calls them hypocrites. Hi, Jackson. And this is exactly what we're seeing in Romans chapter 2, verse 21 through 23. He says to these people, well, if you teach others... Why don't you teach yourself? You tell others not to steal, but do you steal? You say it is wrong to commit adultery, but do you commit adultery? You condemn idolatry, but do you use items stolen from pagan temples? You're so proud of knowing the law, but you dishonor God by breaking it. The point is this, is that we're up there making these fancy prayers, and we're not even living by what we're saying. That's complete hypocrisy, and that doesn't lead people to Jesus at all. We have to stand guard. He also talks about fasting, another religious activity, right? We're supposed to fast. Why are we supposed to fast? Live off the Spirit. Live off the Spirit. Huh? Hear God. Anyone in this group here that's done any fasting, I'm sure you can agree with me that when you starve your stomach, you hear from God do. But here's the thing, this is what happens. People start fasting because they want to hear from God. So they start messing up their hair, wearing raggedy clothes, and start telling everybody about that they're fasting. Look at me. I'm starving myself for God. Look at how holy I am. I'm not eating. You know why? Because that's all I need is the Spirit. Who's getting the fame here? Yeah, it's wrong. That's the, that's the question that we have to ask. Who's getting the fame here? Usually don't have a breeze. But my intention was, it's my fault, I should have told you, is that I wanted to stay there and look out. Might have been a little bit different. I shouldn't have got here late, right? Yeah. yeah. Put it on my fault. Put it on the other ear. Somewhere along the somewhere along the line, like I've I've been a Christian probably like less time than most people here. So I, I, I'm not quite sure when this all happened. And, and I'm not picking on you know when I said something about Granny about that she dresses well and keeps herself well and good language and all that stuff, but there's nothing wrong with that. But somewhere along the line, and, and I don't know where it happened because I read this book and I don't understand it, so maybe somebody can help me. Somewhere along the line, Christianity got pretty. When did Christianity properly dressed people and suits and ties. There's nothing wrong with that in itself. There's nothing wrong with the big hats that the ladies wear with the netting in it and the flowers and all that kind of stuff. But it seems like here in America that we strive to conform people into the image of the well-dressed, well-spoken Jesus. But pay very little time discipling people with the heart of Jesus. That's what we're supposed to be doing. You know, proper behavior, behavior modification. If that's the goal, you're missing the mark. If it's, it's, if it's to clean yourself up so that you can represent Jesus better, 
That's admirable, but it's but it's missed. The gospel has not hit its mark in you. Do you understand? What he's trying to do is to change your heart, and out of the heart, the behavior will change. I don't see enough people paying attention to what I'm saying. I see a lot of heads down. I see a lot of people not paying attention. God's trying to tell you something. And I want you to pay attention. He's trying to invade your heart. He's trying to become important to you. He's trying to change you. You're his ambassador to the world. If he doesn't change you into his image, people won't come to him. He's trying to do something in this world through you. Will you let him? Will you let him? He went to the cross. He set aside the shame of it all. He dealt with it all. That he might save you. That you would have life. That you would be so kind as to pass on that life to others. That after all that he has done for you, isn't it the least you could do but to live for him? Would you do that for him? You know, it's a heart problem. If you look in verse 29, it's not a behavior problem. It's a heart problem. The heart is deceitfully wicked. Despicably wicked and deceitful above all things. It says here that a true Jew... Now, I mentioned this last week, but I, I want to make sure you understand that I'm not calling you guys Jewish. I'm not calling you Jewish. We're all Jewish in a sense that being a Jew is being God's people. He chose them to worship Him, to represent Him to a world, right? Wasn't that what He's done with Christians? None of us are, like, ignorant to the Gospel. None of us are ignorant to the commandments. None of us are ignorant to the Bible. We know that He's chosen us. He's given us some rules to live by. He told us how to worship Him. No one can say, oh, I, I didn't know. You can't. So He's speaking to you. And you're not just one of His people. A true follower, just because you were born of Jewish parents or because you have gone through this ceremony of circumcision, no, a true follower, a true a member of God's family is one whose heart is right with God. And true circumcision is not merely obeying the letter of the law. Rather, it is a change of heart produced by God's Spirit. See, it's a heart issue, not a behavior issue. We see over, if you would do me a favor, just go over to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, verse 45. Jesus is speaking again. And He speaks about this heart problem that people have. And it's not behavior modification. It says that a good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. And an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from what's in your heart. See, that's, that's, the, that's where we need to go. We need to go to the heart level. We need to stop worrying about how much someone drinks and smokes and cusses or has sex, all that kind of stuff that we know we're not supposed to be doing, but that shouldn't be the focus of our ministry. The focus of Jesus' ministry is not to change your behavior, is it? See, what he's saying is what's inside here is naturally going to come out. Remember earlier I said that there should be a change both, both visibly and invisibly? And that the invisible would become visible? That's what he's talking about right here. That what goes on inside of here, it's going to come out. It's going to dictate what you say and what you do. And so God's trying to work on your heart. Now, proper behavior doesn't necessarily mean that a person is right with God. But when a heart is transformed by the Spirit of Christ, it will manifest itself in one's behavior. So what does it look like when the Spirit is allowed to work in a person's heart? What will that heart look like? Will that person pray? Maybe. Will that person fast? 
Maybe. Will that person preach? Maybe. Maybe. You're getting it. The answer is maybe in all these. Things. Will you give? Will you give generously? Maybe. Will you feed the hungry? Maybe. Will you clothe those that are without clothing or ragtag? Maybe. Will you house those that are homeless? Maybe. Will you start reading the Bible? Will you start reading Christian books? Maybe. Some people do those things. It matters not. See, what matters here is the motive. It's the why. It's the why. Who's gained? If, if I start praying and fasting and preaching and giving and feeding and, re and reaching out to the homeless, who's, who's gaining the fame in that? That's the question. If, if, it be, if the ministry becomes about you doing this, oh, it's a problem. If I went out and I started evangelizing each person and every person got saved, every, like that never happens, but if I did that and you get your life to Christ and you gave your life to Christ and everyone I talked to gave their life to Christ, what could that do to my ego? Boom! Right? So sometimes when we're doing those things, it's not about God anymore. It's about you. That's the problem. Will a changed heart do those things? Maybe. But that's really not what God's looking for. See, what God's looking for is a changed heart. Remember I shared that story a couple weeks in a row? I shared it again about Jimmy's Jeep. Try to make me drive that thing today. And I don't know if that was to be nice or to make me hurt. But I didn't drive it. Now, a proper religious boy would not steal someone's Jeep, would they? Oh, yeah. You guys are learning something. All right. But if, if, if listen, because, look, you don't want to get in trouble. Parents might find out. The cops can find out. Go to jail, all that stuff, right? Don't do that. But that's not what God's looking for, that you just don't steal stuff. That you just don't drink. That you just don't cuss. Or you just don't smoke. Whatever the stupid list is. It's not what God's looking for. Sometimes it looks Christian, but it isn't. And sometimes it doesn't look Christian at all, and it is. God's looking for the authentic. You know what I'm saying? See, what he's asking us, and, and, and this is jumping the gun, it's over in Romans chapter 12, we're not going to get there for a while, but he says to not be, copy the behaviors and customs of this world, so that seems like, wait a minute, so I, I have to behave myself, but that's, but it doesn't end there, right? Why don't we do that? Because it looks bad? Because we can get caught? Why? He says, but because he wants to transform you into a new person. Not that you're just not being naughty, but that you're a new person person in Christ. He said, let God transform you into a new person by changing what's on the inside. You see, out of the treasury of the inside comes the outpouring on the outside. And so that's what he's trying to change. And, and so we start letting God's spirit change us. So when, when, when we said yes to Jesus, we realized our position as sinners doomed. And we said finally yes to Jesus Christ, you're my Lord and Savior. It says in the Bible that He gives you His Holy Spirit. So now the Spirit of God, not just as a, a dose of His moral code, but the Spirit of God Himself is living inside of you, right? And He's trying to tell you, hey, do this and don't do that. Not because I want you to look all prim and proper before people, but I'm trying to attract people to me. And I need you to be my ambassador. This is what I want you to do. So he starts painting these broad strokes of different types of character in us. Not, hey, don't steal a Jeep. That's not it. It doesn't say that in here. It does not give specifics in here. It's a change of the way we think. It's a change in the way our heart 
functions. You see, that's what he's looking for. That spirit is now inside of you trying to change with massive influence if you'll just give him a chance. He's trying to change the heart that's inside of you so that you won't want to do these things anymore. That everything you do will be to please the Lord. And if that face right there can attract people to the Savior, then religious activity is awesome. You go to church and give and help and feed and house and all that mission trips. And if it's to lead people to Jesus, then it's great religious activity. That has value. So this Spirit of God is now dwelling. That's kind of crazy, isn't it? Does anyone ever get freaked out about that? That's insanity. That's crazy, right? I mean, just... Just think for a second how little you are compared to just this earth. And the one who spoke everything you see into existence, that same power that did that lives inside of you. Come on! Woo. Right? If no one else is freaked out about that, Woo. that's insane. But it's true. And so he's trying to lead you to represent him to draw men and women to himself. Go, do me a favor, go over to Galatians chapter 5. I beg you to spend time in his word. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Now we know that this Holy Spirit lives in us now, right? He's there. He's there. We said yes to Jesus. Ephesians 1.13. At the moment of conversion, he's given you his Holy Spirit, right? So... Paul says this, let this Holy Spirit guide your life. That's what he says, just let it guide your life. Look at verse 22. If you'll let this Holy Spirit guide your life, he's going to do some things inside of your heart. He's not going to say, don't steal Jimmy's Jeep. He's not going to say, don't kick someone in the shins. He's not going to say, hey, quit flipping that guy off. Don't speed. Stop drinking. Stop cussing. He's not going to give specifics. This is what he's going to do. He's not touching your behavior. What he's doing is touching your heart. And he said, if you'll let him lead you, he'll produce some things inside of your heart. There'll be love. There'll be joy. There'll be peace. There'll be patience. There'll be kindness. There'll be goodness. There'll be faithfulness. There'll be gentleness. We need more of that. And self-control. If I love Jimmy, I won't steal his Jeep. No one wants to steal my car. I, I, I try to help people out that want to steal it. I leave the key in the ignition so you can't be blamed for thievery. Why would we run off on our spouse and leave our children fatherless or momless when God's spirit inside of us creates faithfulness in us? Does it say there, men, don't run off and leave your, your kids? It doesn't say that, does it? What does it say? It says he wants to produce faithfulness inside of you. And when a heart is faithful, it's easy for Pastor Gilligan to say, Honey, I forgive you. It makes it so much easier to, to forgive her. It, it makes it easy when you have a heart that's filled with love and kindness and goodness and gentleness for Pastor Gilligan to raise a child that every time he looks at the child, he sees the face of the man who slept with his wife. Mm. But when God takes his broad brush and he just paints love and peace and joy over your heart, it makes it so much easier to do that. But I could come up to you as a pastor and go, Man, you shouldn't leave your wife. What kind of sin are you? That's terrible. You should take care of your kids. They're your kids. They're your responsibility. Pay your child support, right? That's what you normally get, right? I mean, I've done it. You said it. 
that's not what God's trying to do, right? He's not trying to condemn you. He's trying to change your heart. So you won't want to do those types of things. When you follow God's Spirit, He produces change at the heart level. At the motive level. At the perspective level. At the why. Not the what. That's what God's trying to do. He's trying to change your why. Why you do things. Why you don't do things. Not necessarily what you do. See, what you do and what you say is a result of why. Why is the fuel underneath the what? Does that make sense? It's the motive. It's the energy behind what you say and what you do and what you don't say and what you don't do. It's the why. Why are you doing this that matters? Jesus is our role model, right? Are you with me? He's our perfect role model. We're supposed to be conformed into his image. Do as he would do, right? Well, let me just let me just share this with you. And, and look, I have no power to change your heart, but the word of God can. So just listen, okay? Just listen. John 17, 4. This is what Jesus says. Is your heart ready? Is it ready? So listen. I brought glory to you. He's talking to his father. He says, I brought glory to you to you here on earth by completing the work he gave me to do. Often, Jesus Christ, divine, when people were trying to raise him up as king and give his humanity credit and make him an earthly king, he ducked away from the crowd, didn't he? He didn't even want that. He said, everything that I do, all the work that I do, you, we just spent months talking about the miracles of Jesus. And he said, everything that I did, why? To bring glory to you. Everything. And Jesus is our role model, right? So that should be us. Everything we do, every religious activity should be to bring glory to God. Jesus is our role model. Jesus is our role model. Jesus was out in the desert, tempted by the devil. And he was hungry in his humanity. He fasted for 40 days. And what does it say in the scriptures? Why he went out there? He was led by the Spirit. The humanity of Jesus was led by the divinity in him. And he was led out into the desert. And so what it is that we're supposed to do? Be led by the Spirit. Why? To bring glory to God. That's what we're to do. True Christians do that. They are led by His Spirit to bring glory to God. Religious folks are led by themselves to bring glory to themselves. That's what they do. And I don't want to be one of those people. And I love you guys too much. I don't want you to to be that type of person. Just because it looks doesn't mean that it necessarily is, right? I think that's very, very true. Um, you know, I talk about my little car all the time. It's funny, my little Thunder Road, you know, my Volvo. So, a couple years ago, the wise Alex at the dealership that I worked at, it took badging from a 330 horsepower V8 Hemi truck and they put it on my car. So oftentimes I'm driving down the road, right? And I see the, the car next to me and I look over and the person in the driver's seat's like this and they go, you see him saying like, they're going, what in the world is that? You know? It happens all the time. Um, remember a week or so ago, Jessica's friend came and spoke to us at the church about his ministry in, out in Alabama. You all remember what I'm talking about? Okay. So his car died in our parking lot. And so we had to get a, a starter for it. So we went over to, uh, I went to AutoZone, I think it was. 
AutoZone? Yeah, I bought it at AutoZone. Buy the auto, the starter at AutoZone. And, and, and so, and Kelly and, and Tim, they put it into his car and fixed it and he's off on his way. But there's a core charge, right? You know what I'm talking about? So I go bring the, 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 the old starter back. And so I'm in the parking lot and this guy, he comes up to me. I'm just about getting ready to go in my car and he goes, he goes, man, what is, uh, what's a Thunder Road Volvo? I've never seen that before, you know? <laughs> he thought it was a real, like a, you know, an, an, an addition. I should have just messed with him, you know? But I told him the real story. See, it has a badge of a 330 horsepower V8. My car is 97 horsepower. <laughs> an inline little four banger. Some of you could run as fast as my car. So my point is this, is just because it looks Christian, just because it says it's fast, because it says it's a Thunder Road, it don't mean nothing. He's not looking for some outward mark that identifies you as a Christian, all show and no go, right? That's my car. I keep fighting it though, like every time somebody gets in the car, I always like hammer it and go, see, it's pretty good, isn't it? I'm trying to convince myself that it truly is a Hemi, but it's so not, it's so not. And churches can be that way too, you know? All show and no go make disciples of Jesus. If you look at verse 27 of the text that we read, it basically tells us this, that real Christians don't pose. They really, authentically follow Christ. See, they might not dress right, but they follow well. Because they let God's Spirit cut away the sin in their heart. And they allow the Spirit to produce love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. It's an overhaul of the heart from which your words and actions come out of. That's what God's trying to do. And I, this is what authentic, real Christians do. This is not doctrine I'm about to tell you that you need to do to be a Christian. But I'll tell you this. Real Christians spend time in God's Word. Real Christians spend time in genuine prayer. And listen, I lack that. I know I do. And I'm, I'm working on it. I've been asking God in prayer to help me with my prayer. Do you, you know what I'm saying? I want to follow Jesus because I, I need to hear from His Spirit. Because I've, I've clouded up the water so much that I don't hear Him well. And I want to hear Him because I want my life my words, my actions, my clothing, my hairdo, my car, my family, my church, everything above me. I want this to lead people to the Savior, not to me. I'm a horrible Messiah. A horrible Messiah. I do a horrible job of leading people to Jesus. But, but Jesus is an awesome Messiah. I want to be like Him. But, you know, genuine Christians, they spend time in God's Word. They spend time listening. They spend time reading good books. They spend time listening to good teachers. And this is what they do the most. This is what real Christians do. They consider this Jesus. They consider Jesus. They, they ponder the gospel of Jesus Christ. They spend time. Listen, I don't do this enough, so I'm preaching to me right here. They spend time, think, again, thinking about how unworthy I am. I'm not awesome. How unworthy I am of life. How unworthy I am of having friends like you. How so unworthy I am of having a beautiful wife. How unworthy I am of having these tremendous children. How unworthy I am to come into this house and listen to these guys sing every single week. How unworthy I am to have any breath in my lungs. How unworthy I am to see the trees. How unworthy I am of everything. How I just deserve death and hell. For eternity, I should be in jail. I should be executed for my actions. But yet I am saved and I am loved and I'm going to spend the eternity with my Savior. Like, how insane is that? And when you let that sink down into your heart, it changes who you are. It changes what you say. It changes how you dress. It changes how, how you wear your hair. Those things come because, you know what? I just love Jesus so much. Tell me what to do. I'll do it. 
That, that's it. It's not about following the letter of the law. It's not about putting a cross on my heart. It's about letting the cross of Jesus Christ permeate my heart so it changes who I am. That's what the gospel is. It's not religion. It's this amazing gift that you've been given that you do not deserve. And out of that heart of gratitude, everything fleshes out of that. That's what the gospel is. And that's what Christians do. And when you put yourself in settings like this, spending time in His Word that is alive and it's the power of God to save, when you spend time in that type of environment, you put yourself in position for the Spirit of God to produce a change in your heart. The gospel of Jesus Christ is don't drink, don't smoke, don't do this. It's not that. The power of Jesus Christ, I mean the gospel is the power of God at work to change a heart. And no behavior modification changes a heart. Falling in love with the Savior who died for you that you might have life that's what changes somebody. And that's what we should be focusing on all the time. You know, it's funny. <laughs> you look at a person and the cultural Christian, the, you know, the well-spoken, well-dressed Jesus, that might not be in that person. It might not. It might not, it might not look the role. But the heart that follows Jesus in that person will condemn that well-dressed jerk any day. Any day. That's what God's looking for. That's what God's looking for. At the very end of our text, it talks about a person with a changed heart seeks praise from God and not from people. In today's vernacular, I'd say he's not a poser. It's not a poser. He's not pretending. He's not wearing a mask. She's not behind a facade. It's an authentic person. Let me just say this. That the church, we don't need to be so behaved here. Like, it's okay to come and just puke all over each other. And say, I'm an absolute wreck in this area. It's okay to do that. Because we need to like open up your heart to your loved ones. That's when the Spirit of God can get in there and start to change. Don't fake it. Don't act like everything's okay. Don't when someone says, hey, how's everything going? Praise Jesus, everything's great, amen. Can someone give me an amen? amen. Like nobody, no, no one wants that. Amen. Finally you do it. <laughs> You're so fine in a new church. You guys. You know, religious activity, if it's not the face of someone who genuinely loves and follows Jesus, it's fake, it's facade, it's a mask. Let's take off masks. Let's just be us. Let's just be normal, everyday people with struggles and problems. And let's help each other out. Let's not fake it. Let's not be a poser. Posers want praise from people. They want people to look at them and say, oh, they're awesome. They got it all together. See, that's the thing. Pastors are supposed to have it all together. I don't have it all together. I am a jacked up train wreck. All the time. Getting better. But I'm a mess. I'm a mess. Spirit-led disciples of Jesus only seek to bring attention and fame to God. It's all about why. Everything that you do, if you've changed your behavior in any way, why? Like, don't be satisfied with the fact that you have that you don't drink anymore. Don't be satisfied with that you don't cuss anymore. Why? See, that's what God, I think he wants us to be a little bit more thoughtful. I think we read our Bibles and, and hammer through it and go, well, it says not to do this, I won't do it anymore. Man, that's good. Like, there's a place for obedience. I, I like that. But every time you open the Bible, every time you pray, every time you're in fellowship with a believer, you're talking about the things of God, let him stimulate your thoughts. You know what I mean? Why? Why is it that God doesn't want, I keep saying, why doesn't he want me to steal his Why? What is it? 
that he's trying to do in me. It, there's no answer. It's, everyone's different. The thing is, he's trying to work. The Spirit of God's trying to work in all of us in unique and wonderful ways. But you have to let him. And you have to meditate on it. The gospel is incredible. For years and years and years, people try to get to God by performing religious deeds. And these religious people, the king of the temple, the kings of the temple, the show-offs, the ones who are in charge, they were the worst of all. You see what happens is you start to do things for Jesus so much, and all of a sudden you don't even know the Savior you're working for anymore. You're so busy. I stopped drinking. I stopped cussing. I stopped having sex outside of marriage. I stopped, I put down the porn. I did all this stuff. That's great. Why? So I think if we focus on the why more, we'll never have to focus on the what. Out of a changed heart that has that's filled with love and peace and patience and faithfulness and goodness, a heart that's got that all in it, you need to like reprimand that person because they cuss too much, because they steal, because they lie. They don't do that stuff, do they? God's just trying to take that heart of yours and just paint, paint a new color over it. A new heart. And out of that, that's what we're looking for. We're not looking for outward marks of religion. We're looking for an inward change. That's what God's looking for. Inward change. That becomes visible because your heart is different. Communion, I think. You guys? Uh, you doing it? Sure. Here's Kelly. I love you and I thank you for letting me do this. Sorry for this yucky microphone. Let me turn it up. We're in the Windy City. We must be in Chicago. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Try to keep it up a little bit. Every week we get together for communion. If there's an answer to that question of why, I think this might be part of it. The communion, we do together. We, we do this together. It's still out there. Yep. Okay. We do it together. There's a unity in it. There's a why in it. Because it reminds us of what it took to get us right. And that's the why. So I want to read just a, a few passages out of John, chapter 8. You, you've probably heard this before. And this is not your normal communion thought, but think about the why. John writes, Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered, and he sat down and taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman caught, was caught in the act of adultery, and the law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him and saying something they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer. So he stood up again and said, All right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, Where are your accusers? Did even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And he said, Neither do I. Go and sin no more. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's the why. And, and she never saw it coming. He, he took the rules that... He didn't deny that she deserved stoning, that that's what the rules said. He agreed, didn't he? Okay, go ahead, he said. But how about this? One without sin, you throw the first rock. And nobody could do it. 
because every one of us is in that same boat. Every one of us has been in the spot that that woman is when we're caught red-handed. We know we deserve what we get. And then all of a sudden, somehow, there's grace and there's mercy. There's a why to it. So as we, we have this little cracker and, and this little cup, the, the body broken of Christ, broken for us, the blood spilled out for us. We see the why we can change, why maybe our hearts can just believe a little bit. Because somebody would stand up for us when we were caught red-handed and not condemn us. But, but even more than that, would actually take the blow for us. That's why. Why do I come to church? Why do I try to love people? Because I've been loved by Jesus Christ, and that's, that just blows me away. Why do we take communion every week? To help remind us all of that same thing we share it together. So, if you got a little cracker, let's take the body of Christ broken for us. And the juice, his blood spilled out for us. Father, I don't know. It's one of those mysteries. How you can forgive us for all the things we've all done. And, and, and how grace works. It's marvelous. It's wonderful. And it's beyond our imaginations. Beyond our, our ability to fathom. And it's what makes you awesome, amazing, wonderful worth loving, worth following, worth changing, is that you would give up your son's life so that we would know you and have true life. We thank you, Father, for all your blessings, for all your love, and all your good deeds, which know no measure. It's in Christ's name. How great is our God? Sing with me. How great is our God? No, we'll sing. How great, how great is our God? Sing that together again. How great. Yeah. Hey.
us with the opportunity to come out here and sit in your presence, Lord, under your creation, to hear your voice, Lord, to hear you speak to our hearts, directly to our hearts, Lord, as only you can do, Lord. Only by the power of your Holy Spirit are our hearts truly changed. Lord God, we thank you that we can't do it on our own, Lord. Not just that we don't have to do it on our own, but that we can't, Lord. Because in that simple fact, we know that we have to rely on you. Lord, that all we can do in our own will is to draw near to you and to trust in you to do the rest. Lord, to seek first the kingdom of God and trust that you'll take care of the rest. Lord God, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys.